You're listening to the Tomorrow Society Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Heaton, and my guest today is Christian Moran, who is the author of the book Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow, Walt Disney and Technology, which was released by Theme Park Press this past May, and he's also working on a documentary of the same subject. And Christian's also a filmmaker who directed the feature-length documentary Ayahuasca Diary and the web series Everything Will Be All Right. And I think it was a really good conversation. We dug into Christian's background with Disney and what drove him to make the book, and then talked about some other projects he's done and what he's going to do in the future. So let's get right to it. Here's my conversation with Christian Moran. Okay, my guest today is Christian Moran, who is the author of the book Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow, Walt Disney and Technology. He's also a filmmaker, and there's a documentary connected with it, which is going to be coming down the road. So, Christian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, great. It's, it's great to have you. I enjoyed the book. And uh, before we really dig into the book, which I definitely want to do, I'm curious, um, just how did you get interested just in Walt Disney and, um, you know, his theme parks and the Disney company? Okay, well, I think that there's uh, a few different answers to that. I think uh, one of the most important ones was that uh, I grew up in Ohio, but my uh, father's father lived down in Florida, so we would go and visit him uh, at least once a year from a young age, and my parents always tried to take me down to Disney World for at least a day or something when when we would do that. So I was fortunate to, even though I grew up far away from Disney World, I was able to visit the parks quite often. And, and you know, of course, my parents uh, grabbed me a bunch of the VHS of the animated classics growing up. And I also grew up in a time in the early 90s when the Disney Channel was still kind of focused on historical Disney material and stuff. And I was able to you know, take that in and and get the more historical features of the Disney company uh, into my brain at a young age. Yeah, it's really too bad that because I I grew up a little bit earlier than you, but um, in the '80s more. But it's really too bad yeah. that the Disney Channel. I mean, I I have kids and they love the shows, so but yeah. it's too bad they don't have even a separate channel that's more just about the history because there's so many people that are interested in it. So um. What was when you went early on? I mean, was it just something kind of to do? I mean, what was what really drew you to wanting to go back to the parks in the 90s? I guess it was just, you know, always just having a a great time. And I guess looking back on it uh, as an adult, you know, uh, children obviously like to imagine and dream and whatever. And and the, the Disney parks really kind of are a true escape from reality for a lot of people from their daily problems and, and worries. And, you know, you just, it's hard to have a bad day at, at a Disney park, I guess. So it's just, you know, a lot of good memories growing up and spending time there with my family and everything. For sure. And did that go right through into when you were an adult or was there some other, I mean, other way that you started to connect as you got older and it wasn't just about kind of going with the family? Well, I think that that kind of started to happen when I was 19. I uh, moved out of Columbus and moved to Los Angeles to go to film school. And uh, when that happened, obviously, I was very close to Disneyland and uh, had only really been there once in my life. My parents had traveled out there, I think, in maybe 92 when I was about seven. And we spent a day at Disneyland at that time. And didn't really remember it compared to, you know, my other memories at Disney World. But as I uh, was finally able to go there on a more regular basis, since I'm in the Los Angeles area, I really began to appreciate the Disneyland park and learn the history of it. And, you know, it's it's the only Disney park that Walt Disney was ever able to to spend any time in, you know. And uh, you, I guess I feel like you can kind of feel his presence there a bit more. But being, again, kind of in, embedded in that type of history at the Disneyland park helped me to want to go and learn more about uh, the parks and the company and Walt Disney himself. Yeah, and I can kind of sympathize with that because, I mean, I went to Disneyland once as a very young kid and didn't really, I mean, I was too young to really get it, but I went a few years ago and I'd always been going to Disney World. And you're right, it, it's the same, but I feel like it's different. Yeah, I mean, exactly. and not, not, not at the expense of Disney World, but more just one because it's so much smaller 
but you just there's you can just the way the the touches of it are different. I mean, I think the how intimate it is really makes a difference. And then all the the areas that still connect to Walt Disney, it's it was I can't wait to go back. Absolutely, yeah. I, that's uh, those are all the reasons that I love Disneyland. But you're right; it's not to say that Disney World isn't uh, a fantastic place. But uh, to me, there's just something a little bit more about Disneyland, I guess. Yeah. So what what got you interested um, in kind of the technology technology and some of the advancements, both in animation and in the parks that came about through the Disney Company? Well, I've always been fascinated by technology uh, from a young age, science and technology. And, um, you know, as I uh, got a little older, I think the thing that really got me interested in Walt Disney's use of technology was um, the Disney company released the Disney Treasures DVD series in the early 2000s. And they were selling those at the Disneyland Park. And one day I saw that they had a DVD in a tin can called Tomorrowland. And it was about Oh, yes. You know, promoting the various more futuristic uh, beliefs of the, you know, Tomorrowland television series in the 50s. And it also contained the Epcot film on it, which was the, I guess, last uh, recorded, you know, of, of Walt Disney being on camera. And it was where he p- was pitching to the uh, state legislature of Florida his idea for Epcot as a city and what Disney World was originally going to be and everything. And once I heard that he was trying to build cities, I started getting super interested in his backstory, you know, and where, what technologies he was using to develop, you know, as you said, animation in his younger years up to robotics as he got older and eventually trying to build cities. Yeah. And that film is so interesting because in one sense, there are parts of it that really do lay the groundwork for what Disney World is, but how forward thinking he was to things that still aren't really happening with technology today. And, um, I've picked, I have a copy of, or I picked up a copy of that DVD, um, before and seeing that really, I mean, it's different to see the little clips that you see of him talking about Epcot, but to see the whole thing, it's, it's intriguing because I mean, it, it paints a slightly different picture of the guy that you would normally, that, um, you know, you see from the clips of the old Disneyland TV series. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah, so, I mean, here's the tricky part, because, I mean, you do, your book is only about, it's about 140 pages. I don't want to say only, because it has a lot of good information. But how do you, when you're talking about a topic like Disney and technology, how does that narrow down, how do you find a way to kind of, narrow that down where it does, you know, because you could easily do 500 pages on something like that. Oh, absolutely. I guess, um, you know, my intent with this is to try and I'm not, I wasn't trying to write a, uh, you know, a, a, a PhD thesis or something extremely technical. I was just trying to get the, the general points across of the various technologies that Walt Disney and his staff were responsible for creating, you know, in terms of trying to push the animation industry forward and then eventually urban planning and transportation and all kinds of other interesting things. So I guess I just I'm trying to get people interested in in the general idea of Walt Disney as a as the futurist. And so that was my my main intent. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that definitely comes across. And especially, I mean, when you're talking about things like the Epcot Center City, which, um, you know, is I know you go into this into the book, but I'm I'm curious to get you to talk a bit about because, you know, there's been a lot of a lot of chatter saying, well, there's no way it would have worked. It would have bankrupted the company. And granted, without Walt there, that might have happened, you know, but um, do you think I mean, let's say because, you know, his wife lived well, well, in you know, decades further. So, I mean, in some alternate universe where even he lived another 15 years, do you think it would have happened? Do you think that we would, because if it would have happened, if it would have been built, we'd still have it. Would we have it today or would it have destroyed the company? Oh, I think that it 100% would have happened had Walt lived to see it through. And I mean, it's interesting that you bring up people say that it wouldn't have worked and it would have bankrupted the company. That happened in almost every other venture that he attempted in his life. You know, when he tried to create Snow White, the first uh, feature-length animated film, the press referred to it as Disney's Folly. And uh, the same thing happened again 
when he announced that he was going to build a, a theme park. You know, people in both these instances thought this is an insane man. Nobody is going to want to watch it an animated film that's 90 minutes. Nobody's going to want to go to a, a Disney amusement park. I'm sure people would have said the same thing about Epcot. Oh, Walt Disney, now he thinks he can build cities. I'm sure he would have built the city and it would have worked. And who knows what, what could have uh, been birthed off of Epcot, you know, what Walt Disney have gone to after building cities. It's an interesting question. Yeah, and I think I'm pretty much on the same page. And I, I mean, I'm I hate to summarize and because there's been plenty of things written. Sam Genoway wrote a very interesting book, kind of a what it oh, would have yeah. been like, and uh, Walden, the Promise of Progress City. Yeah. And there's been a lot written about the fact that it probably could have worked. So, but it's just an, it's such an interesting topic because you know we'll never know, obviously. And while I love the original Epcot Center, it was. Basically, you know, they took more of the World's Fair concept versus, you know, trying to, you know, build a city, especially given the economic realities of the 70s. Exactly, exactly. You're right. And I think, you know, you kind of brought up earlier, uh, could it have worked without Walt? And the, the answer I've always gotten as to why they didn't do it is because Walt was the only person that could have got it done because Walt... It would have taken more than just the Disney company. Walt was looking for outside help from other technology corporations to kind of help him plan it and and have, you know, basically research and development facilities there for their companies and that the uh, people that worked at these R&D facilities would live at Epcot. And so it was, you know, Walt had access to any CEO of a corporation he wanted to talk to. The other members at Disney, not so much. Right. I mean, it was basically, oh, Walt Disney wants to talk to me. I'll always take his calls. And you exactly. saw that with the six, 64 World's Fair where, you know, he was able to, you know, do do basically what he wanted to get his attractions made and set it up later because he had so much power. Exactly. So um, switching gears a bit, I did mention Sam Genoway. And one thing that's interesting about your book, and I assume connects to the fact with, with setting up the documentary, is that you have – clips of, of text and, you know, information from a really impressive group of with several Disney Imagineers, Raleigh Crump and Bob Gurr. Yeah. And then you. like Jim Corcus and Sam Genoway and then Maureen Furness, who's a, who's a Ph.D. and has a lot of interesting things to say. So I'm curious just about the process. How did you go about kind of connecting with that group? Was it involved with you were shooting video of them and this is kind of transcripts from it or was it set up in kind of a different way? Oh, you're, you're 100% correct. So the, the genesis of this entire project was uh, as a film. Uh, you know, I've wanted to, I've had this idea for a while about making a film or, or something about Walt Disney and his relation to futurism and technology and things of that nature. It was an aspect of Walt Disney I thought was interesting that I had never seen any kind of work really completely dedicated to. So I thought maybe I could have something to, to you know, say about that. So I just reached out to, you know, everyone that's in the film. I, I found through email and reached out to, and they were kind enough to, to give me their time and and help, and we filmed them, uh, you know, filmed the interviews for the film, and by the time we got to Jim Corcus, who was the, the last person we interviewed, we traveled to him in Florida, um, I kind of thought, well, you know, I interviewed Mr. Corcus, I interviewed Sam Genoway, and they were both published by Theme Park Press, so I, you know, contacted Theme Park and asked if they might be interested in a, in a book form of the project, and uh, they said yes, so off I went to writing that, and... Uh, Luckily, they liked it and printed it, and I'm still trying to get the book, the film finished. So it's funny, it starts as a film, you know, and in that period, I have enough time to write a book about it, and I'm still working on the film. So, so how is the process going with with the film in terms of um, what stage are you at right now? Are you getting footage? Or are you more um, trying to put it all together, or kind of a mix of both? Well, we uh, we you know the interviews have all been shot for a while uh, about. I guess last December was the last interview that was shot. And, you know, you go through various phases of editing. First, we had to put all of the interviews together and kind of siphon down the information into a chronological order and then begin picking apart what we want to use and what we maybe don't want to use. And right now we're in the process of laying, laying 
B-roll over top of everything. And right now we're into about the, uh, I think we just ended with the 64 World's Fair today. So we're actually on the precipice of starting the the Epcot uh, part of the film, and that'll be fun to get into now. Definitely. So how do you go about um, gathering? Because obviously you want to have footage of some of, you know, the World's Fair and Epcot and things from the past what I mean, is it a real challenge to gather some of that footage to use for the film? Um, some some of it is absolutely, but uh, you know we're luckily I've been accumulating kind of uh, archival Disney material for you know a decade or more and have access to some of these more uh, rare to this you know more rare footage that's out there that we can kind of integrate into the film. So some of it is more difficult to come by. Some of it is it's plentiful, but luckily. Uh, being a student of, uh, I guess, Disney history for this long and trying to accumulate as much of its material as I can, I've been able to kind of look through a lot of footage and see what's relevant to putting into the film or not. Yeah, I expect there's probably, it's not a matter of not having any footage. It's more a matter of having so much and trying to pick out the, the right thing. Absolutely. I mean, the, you you and everyone listening to this knows how deep the uh, Disney library goes. And uh, so it's, there's a lot out there. <laughs> For sure. I want to talk a bit about, um, I get the distinct impression from your book and just from the little bit I know about you that, I mean, you're definitely on the side of, you know, the optimistic view of the future and kind of the futurist idea, which came up a lot in the movie that came out this summer, Tomorrowland, and that yeah. kind of idea that, you know, we need to be thinking forward and be positive. Now, that movie didn't do very well, and I don't want to overthink why. There's many reasons beyond the message. Yeah. But a lot of criticisms came about because of that. So should we read much into this? I mean, do you think that is the culture still in the same place we were? Even, I mean, not going back in the 60s. I'm talking about even in the early 80s when Epcot Center came out, or even in the 64 World's Fair. It's It's kind of a big question, but... Do you think that we still have, I mean, that we still have that same kind of forward thinking view that we might have had during the space program and all the things that happened 30, 40 years ago? Um, I think that we still have forward thinkers in our society. Uh, I don't think that our society in general is as optimistic or as forward thinking as as we were, you know, in the time spans you stated 30 to 50 years ago. Which is unfortunate because I think that, you know, obviously there are a lot of problems affecting America and the, the human race at large today. And I think the only way we're going to be able to solve these problems is by, you know, uh, taking Walt Disney's course of action, which is, you know, acknowledging that there are ways to solve our problems and figuring out what those ways are and, you know, doing it. And that's what he and his team did at, at WED and in animation and everything. And I think that we can learn something from that as a species and say, you know, if Walt Disney can, uh, can believe that we can do all these things and, you know, he always believed in the power of himself and his organization. If we believe in the power of ourselves as a species, I believe we can do the same thing and build a better world. Yeah, I definitely agree with pretty much whatever you, what you said right there that you have to, try and stay positive and look forward but obviously you know there's still challenges especially given where we currently are right now but i get that same sense and i think this is a good point to bring up your web series that um you've been working on um everything will be all right which oh, where you, oh, yeah. you're talking to you know i feel like the people a lot of the people you talk with um are experts on forward thinking technologies like 3d printing and solar energy and even talking about healthcare. And I'm curious to hear a little bit about what drove you. I mean, you pretty much, I think, just described it. But what kind of drove you to start the series and um, if it's still ongoing or kind of just a little more about that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So the term everything will be all right is something that, you know, my father always said to me growing up when, uh, you know, tough times came around or or anything like that. But yeah, things might be difficult right now, but in the end, everything will be all right. And that's kind of how I feel about, uh, you know, the situations the human race faces today. And, uh, you know, knowing that and knowing that there are other people out there who, you know, believe that 
we can do better and face the challenges of today and come out with positive outcomes, I, uh, you know, searched those people out and tried to uh, interview as many of them as I could. And the uh, the 10 people that I was fortunate enough to interview that are on the uh, web series there were kind enough to give me their time. And hopefully, you know, I learned a lot from them in regards to all kinds of technologies and, uh, you know, economic philosophies and possibilities. And, uh, you know, hopefully other people that check it out will will learn something from it as well. But uh, I guess, you know, all that I am trying to say is trying to help people understand that, yeah, there there's a tough time today, but we can fix it. Here are experts that can teach us how to fix it, and let's try and do something about it. Great, and I, I did was able to check out a, a few of those videos, and I would highly Thank recommend you. them because, I mean, especially if you're somebody who's – um interested in some of the cutting edge technologies, but also kind of the, the thinking behind them, the philosophies. I think that's where you really dig in well with your guests. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And speaking, this is kind of an awkwardly shifting back to the book here, but <laughs> I'm curious a bit about the introduction because okay. in in the intro, I think um, you, you decide, instead of really talking about the technology, you focus more on Walt Disney and kind of talk about his character and kind of some recent attacks about racism and sexism and different things that have come against him. And, and you're responding to kind of those misconceptions. And I'm just curious to get your take on why you decided that was, that was the way to start your book about Walt Disney and technology. Um, I guess I felt that it was relevant because the, the book focuses on Walt and his use of technology to, to do these great things, but it also focuses on his, his optimism, I guess. And I guess, you know, the way he lived his life kind of, I guess, represents an, an ideal to me that, you know, you can do better than what you have been doing. And so, um, you know, with all these uh, rumors that have been put out there recently, I knew that if I just started uh, right into, oh, well, you know, Walt was doing all this great stuff with technology that some people reading it would probably say, well, yeah, but he was a racist and an anti-Semite and a sexist and whatnot. So I felt that it was important to kind of try and uh, break away the myths and lies that have grown up about him over the course of the decades since he's been gone and kind of present a true picture of who Walt Disney was, not to say that he was a perfect man, but he's not the man that a lot of people make him out to be. So I thought it was I just felt that it was important to try and paint a more realistic picture of Walt Disney moving into the main, you know, thesis of the of the project. Yeah, that may, that makes sense. And I think that's the tricky part with anyone that has received as much attention, as much love as Walt Disney, where you have the kind of two extremes. You have the the side that sometimes gets brought forward by now by the Disney company as this perfect almost imaginary figure. And yeah. then you have the other end, which is he was this evil person who, <laughs> yeah. you know, and I mean, the real, the real thing is, I mean, obviously he accomplished great things, but it's not, no, no one's that simple. Yeah. So I just thought it was an interesting way to start, but um, that makes sense. And I think that you get to that a bit more with what I thought was one of the best sections in the book, which is just the simple question you asked the panel, just, how do we remember him? Yeah. And I found it really interesting that they all had very similar answers they in terms did, of their they? theme. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, what what is your take on that? I mean, would, if if someone asks you, how do you remember Walt Disney? Would it be similar? I mean, obviously, it's different than like Rolly Crump, who actually worked with them, or Bob Gurr. But I mean, where does that stand? What what for you is? I mean, there's about a hundred different answers <laughs> that I could give personally. But yeah. what for you is the thing that if somebody asks you? Give me a minute on this. Um, I guess what I think is important to, to remember about Walt from, you know, my own perspective is, is, his, is his optimism, is his belief in not only himself, but in his team and his, his people and in his ideas and their ideas and that if they could work together, you know, if they could dream it, as it said, they could do it. Um, but again, I also think it's important as, you know, what I believe that you're referring to the main answer that all the people I interviewed gave me was that we need to walk, remember that Walt Disney was a man. He was a human being. He was a real person. He wasn't perfect. He wasn't, you know, 100% great. He wasn't 100% evil, but he was a man trying to do what he thought was best. And uh, 
he was a man, and if he can do these things, then maybe we can too. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was referring to, because especially you get people like Bob Kerr and Rolly Crump, who have so much, you know, have great books, especially Rolly that's put together, yeah. which um, where they have so many interesting recollections. And I feel like when you hear from them, you get this very nuanced portrayal of a grump who didn't like phonies and, did, you know, yeah, and yeah, was, absolutely. could often... Yeah, like if you read a book about his him and his brother, they had times where they didn't speak to get, for months. Yeah, I mean, so he he had his temperament, but I, it's you know that's one that makes him almost seem what he accomplished seem more impressive. Oh, a- absolutely, I agree with that. But I I think that what you said was was important in in particular with what uh, Rolly Crump had to say about his relationship with Walt. That Walt did not like he didn't. He was complicated. He he did not like yes men at all, while at the same time he didn't want to just be to- told no on something, you know. So you had to – I think what he appreciated more than anything from what I learned from Rolly Crump was that Walt appreciated honesty and that if you were an honest person, regardless of what your opinion was on a subject, he would respect you. Right, right. And, I mean, so much – we hear so much when um, – the modern Disney management comes out with any type of new attraction. Mm -hmm. They announce a new frozen ride and they say, Walt said Disneyland would never, you know, they bring out the quotes from Walt Disney (laughs) and I don't mean to be too critical of the current management, but I'm just curious to get your thoughts. I mean, I'm sure you, I expect you still go to Disneyland a lot. If I lived in LA, I would definitely go a lot. Um, But kind of what's it like for you now? I mean, how do the parks play a role for you now when you go? Oh, the parks when I go there now. Well, my wife and I are annual pass holders, so we try to get down there as as often as we can. But she and I, you know, we at this point, we try to go there. And as many times as we've been, we try to have, I guess, create new experiences, right? New ways to to go to the park, new things to try and learn. And as many times as we've been there, there are still things that we've never done before. And I think that's one of the amazing things about the Disney parks is that there's so many nuances to everything that there are always new things to to experience. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I've been to Disney World so many times, and it's it's amazing how many things. I mean, there there's more parks, but how many things you haven't done, you don't do, or there's always something else. So, well, that yeah, I mean, California, I think especially with so many annual pass holders like yourself. I think it's it's a different feeling, and I really like the feeling there because people seem to know the park so well. It's a very different feeling in California. Absolutely. And um, you're, uh, you mentioned earlier that you're a filmmaker, and I did want to ask you about your um, documentary feature that you directed. Oh, thank you, yeah. Which is um, the Ayahuasca Diary. I apologize yeah. if I did not pronounce that right. <laughs> no, it's but about... very close. It, it just, just the Ayahuasca Diary. Ah, yeah. he's got a... Not be as awkward as jarring. You just got to power through it. It's a, it looks <laughs> like a weird word. You just got to get through it. <laughs> yeah, and about you know alternative mes- medicines in um in the Amazon rainforest of Peru. So what really drew you to doing that project? Well, um, before I became a filmmaker and before I was in film school, I was studying to be an archaeologist. And a uh, long time ago, I went to uh, an archaeological conference and saw a, a speaker there who. Um, Gave a, gave a presentation on his research into this uh, substance, ayahuasca, which is a uh, tea made by the indigenous people of the Amazon. It's been made for thousands of years, and it's most famous for causing very strong hallucinations or, or visions. And the uh, people that have been using it for all this time also claim that it can cure various illnesses. And the man giving the presentation was focusing more on the visionary aspect, which I guess most people do. And he kind of offhandedly mentioned that, you know, he had gone down there and and tried ayahuasca and they claimed that it could cure these diseases. And he said, you know, I had suffered from migraine headaches my entire life. And after I drank, I haven't had a migraine since. And then he kind of moved on to the next subject. And I thought that that was an important point that he wasn't really focusing on. So I began to do some research into various uh, ayahuasca healers in the Amazon and uh, came into contact with with a, a group that was doing that and uh, ended up making the film with them. So, 
Really, and it was a, a positive experience the whole the whole project. <laughs> well, I'll tell you that it was a positive experience. Uh, you know, the outcomes of it with, uh, you know, the the people that I had brought down with us to to document their experience. Uh, one man had cancer, prostate cancer. A uh, woman had rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, to see their process, and, and they were, uh, you know, did go through healing uh, from that. As a matter of fact, the uh, the man who had suffered from prostate cancer, uh, you know, went to UCLA and had a biopsy done and his cancer was gone. And I interviewed him actually again in, uh, I think about a year or two ago. And uh, he is still cancer free to this day and, and attributes that trip uh, to his state. And the, the woman who had rheumatoid arthritis, she, she got uh, better for a while. Uh, unfortunately, it did kind of regress. She did kind of regress back to that. But I think that if she would take the time to go back down there and trying it again, that she, you know, would find herself uh, healed again. But, so those aspects were good. You know, seeing them go through the healing process was was a very rewarding experience. Uh, but the actual production was was probably the most difficult production of my life. I hope it's the most difficult production of my life because I was a 23 year old filmmaker who basically said I'm going to go to the Amazon rainforest and make a documentary. And, uh, it was a big, a big learning oh my experience, gosh. I guess you could say. So. Yeah. So it sounds like a, a mixed, mixed experience though. It's, a, that's amazing. Some of the results though. I mean, that's, that's stunning. Yeah. Pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. So you, you mentioned that, um, you're working obviously on the doc, finishing your documentary. Are there any other projects that you're working on that, that, um, are currently happening? Oh well, actually, to to I guess to go back to ayahuasca, um, I uh, am working. I head my family's charitable foundation, uh, the Grant Town Foundation, and we're working with some of the the people involved in the film. Uh, if you watch it, uh, the shaman's apprentice in the film is named Carlos, and we're currently working with him to try and build a, a clinic down there, a facility in the Amazon, to kind of uh, bridge the gap between Western medicine and uh, using ayahuasca, trying to hopefully prove the medicinal benefits of ayahuasca. So that's uh, one project I'm currently working on. And then in terms of entertainment and whatnot, I am just finished up the first draft to a comic book uh, the other day, and we're going to be trying to see what can happen from that. And then I've always got uh, ideas for documentaries in my head. I kind of have an idea for what I'll be working on next, but I guess I've should probably get this one finished before I focus too much on the next one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure that there's always so many ideas and it's it's a matter of kind of finishing a project. Oh yeah. That's that's the most difficult part. It's easy to start a project. It's difficult to end it. I can understand that and I don't I'm not making documentaries. <laughs> so I think that's the case in a lot of things. Um so where can our listeners find more about you or even about your films online? Oh, well, you can uh, visit my website, www.christianmoran.com. And uh, I, let's see, I'm also uh, my social media stuff on Instagram. I'm at christian.m.moran. Twitter, I'm just Christian M. Moran. And I believe my Facebook page is uh, facebook.com slash IAMCM, IAMCM. So uh, check out my work. They're free. And uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it or get something from it. And uh, hopefully you'll like Great Big Beautiful tomorrow when it comes out as well. Well, great. Well, Christian, thanks a lot. Um, I really enjoyed reading your book and, and learning more about what you're doing. And thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I truly appreciate it. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Christian Moran. I'd like to thank Christian for being on the show and having such a good conversation. You can learn more about Great Big Beautiful tomorrow at themeparkpress.com. You can find out what Christian's doing at christianmoran.com. If you'd like to stay in touch with me, you can follow me on Twitter at TomorrowSOC or like our Facebook or Instagram page. And of course, there's the blog at tomorrowsociety.com. If you like this show, you can go and leave a rating or a review on iTunes or subscribe to the podcast. And thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you guys again soon.